So we're going to start with a panel discussion on cybercrime, its management, the UK's role as a prominent global player in combating it, um, and perhaps also a proposal that have been made for a global cybercrime convention. Your chair for this session is Louise Bennett, who is a colleague on the organizing committee uh, for the UK IGF. Uh, Louise has an extraordinary record in the computing and IT worlds over many years, covering both private and public sectors. Um, she's a director of the Digital Policy Alliance, and she's a prolific advisor to government. Um, and I sat alongside her on committees of various kinds for about 15 years, I suspect. Um, uh, you can read more about her biography in the, in the background papers for the session, so I won't go into that in detail. I'll hand over now to Louise, who will introduce her panel. Oh, good morning. Um, this panel is entitled, How can the UK become a global leader in the prevention of cybercrime? The panel consists of three people. Joyce Hackney, who is a senior researcher at Chatham House. Detective Chief Inspector Phil Donnelly from the City of London uh, Police, who has worked alongside Andy Gould for the last three years and has kindly stepped up to the plate after Andy had to pull out at the 11th hour. Phil has the very intriguing title of Cyber and Dark Web Technical and Capabilities Lead. Um, and our third panelist is Victoria Baines, a respected researcher who's worked for Europol and the Oxford Inter Internet Institute, among others. I'd like to start by setting the scene. Uh, the demand for digital services is expected to double in the next 10 years. We all know that online life can give individuals, businesses and other organisations fantastic benefits. During the pandemic, the internet has enabled physically safe human interactions, including education and commerce, to continue during lockdowns. However, online crime has also exploded. In the UK, crime has increased by a third in the last 12 months, with UK losses to fraud estimated at £52 billion. The UK is not an outlier in this respect. Last year in the USA, almost half of all Americans experienced financial crime online, costing them three quarters of a trillion dollars. These are staggering losses. The victims of online crime are often in one jurisdiction and the perpetrators in another. So preventing crime is both a national and a global endeavor. The best ways for us to reduce online crime is what this panel is going to explore. We'll have short presentations from three panel members followed by Q&A. Please can you type any questions that you have for the panel in the Q&A function, not in the chat. Joyce will outline some of the international initiatives to protect individuals and businesses from online crime. Phil will outline the working relationships for fighting crime across the UK, including key programs such as Prevent, the Police Cyber Alarm Tool for small and medium enterprises to download and to help protect themselves, and the regional cyber resilience centres. Victoria will tell you about her work on how to support individuals and SMEs to keep safe online. All three will be emphasizing throughout what we should do more of and what equally uh, is not working so well. They'll be outlining pragmatic ways of achieving a safer internet for all that is being developed in the UK so that this can form part of the UK IGF input to the UN IGF. First, I'd like to ask Joyce to outline for us what you think are the key international in initiatives to combat crime on the internet and how the UK can best contribute to them. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, and uh, thank you for IGF UK for inviting me to be part of this panel, which is really asking an extremely timely question about how can the UK play um, or become a, glo a global leader on prevention of cybercrime. And I will structure my comments around two points. The first, uh, or maybe these points also represent opportunities that the UK can uh, capitalize on and can invest uh, uh, more in. And the, the first one is around what was mentioned in the in the introduction around the uh, policy making process, the new UN convention uh, process, and second around existing capacity building efforts at the global level. And 
my comments um, are more sort of what can the UK do at the global level? How can it help other countries step up their effort in fighting cybercrime? As it was mentioned um, uh, in earlier, cybercrime is a transnational crime. It does not respect the borders. And as you said, Louise, the, the efforts have to be national and also international. Um, and the fight against cybercrime requires everyone to step up their efforts and requires everyone to increase their capacity. So um, just to start, I'd like to say that, of course, the UK has already an important experience in uh, combating cybercrime. And this experience is, um, you know, manifested in sort of national practices, which I'm sure Phil and Victoria will speak to, but also internationally. Um, and I would like to give some context as to, you know, the what is going on now with the uh, global cybercrime policymaking and some context on the UN cybercrime process that David mentioned. So the pe people who follow the UN developments on cybercrime know that this new process is not the efforts, um, you know, of uh, you know, overnight work. It's rather, um, you know, basically the efforts of sustained or sustained efforts over over the years um, by countries such as Russia, who have been pushing for a new UN convention on cybercrime to replace existing uh, conventions, in particular, the Council of Europe uh, Convention on Cybercrime, also known as the Budapest Convention. Uh, so, this effort really is, uh, or this development is quite significant uh, for the fight against cybercrime internationally, and I'll say why and how. So in 2019, a resolution passed at the UN General Assembly, um, basically um, asking or forming a, an ad hoc committee to develop an international convention on cybercrime. In January of 2022, the first negotiation uh, session will be held, and uh, the expectation is that there will be uh, six sessions that will alternate between Vienna and New York on, um, on this topic, and that by the end of this process, there will be a treaty, uh, a UN treaty on cybercrime, which will be uh, put up for uh, signature and ratification from uh, state, uh, for member states. Now, the UN Convention on Cybercrime will, you know, more likely follow, obviously, all focus on three main areas. Criminalization, basically, what are the offenses that should be criminalized and considered as, uh, as crimes? The second one around the procedures and, and safeguards. Um, how can uh, cybercrime law enforcement investigate, um, you know, and what are the procedures that they should follow? And the third element around international cooperation. And just looking at what states have submitted uh, so far on this, if we look at, so far we've had three submissions from states on how they see this UN convention develop. And the most significant, I would say, is the one submitted by Russia, um, which basically uh, is or represents a complete draft, 69-page draft of a, um, of a treaty that they are suggesting, that Russia is suggesting to be used as the basis of the negotiation um, in, that will start in, in January. And if we look at that draft, uh, there are few issues uh, that are of extreme concern. And I will structure those sort of issues around these three areas. So first on criminalization, um, the, the suggested draft expands the uh, you know, the, the offenses that are considered as crimes to stuff like coercion to suicide, terrorism, extremism, etc. That, of course, as the probably the speakers will talk about more, has a quite a big implication, not just on human rights and what we consider as cybercrime, but also on the dual criminality aspect, which basically requires that there is a, commonly, a, a common understanding um, and recognition by all legal systems of what constitutes a crime. Um, the second on procedures and safeguards, uh, the, the Russian draft suggests, you know, like lower safeguards and have um, quite a vague language when it comes to, um, to human rights and to how these human rights can be protected. And third, on international cooperation and particularly around is extradition, there are quite big limitations on when, um, you know, states can cooperate and should cooperate. And why am I saying this? I'm, and, and sort of in relevance to this conversation, I'm saying this because obviously the UK and other countries have a very important role to play in this process in maintaining and building on the progress that has been achieved so far. So 
this, the efforts to fight cybercrime are not new. Um, I mentioned the Budapest Convention, there are other initiatives, and countries, of course, have been building their national systems and, and infrastructure to, to fight cybercrime. So it's very, very important to maintain that progress that has been achieved and build on that progress and not deviate from it by creating sort of parallel process and renegotiating something that has already been in place and is working for a number of years. Are the um, existing measures perfect? Of course, they're not. Are there limitations on how they work and how they fight cybercrime? Yes, there are. But is it important to take into consideration what has been achieved and build on it? I would argue that absolutely uh, there is a very big need to do so and not to deviate from that and to kind of go into a direction which might have a um, quite an adverse impact on, on human rights and on the way countries uh, fight cybercrime. And another way that um, the UK and other countries can uh, can do is obviously sort of push for a transparency and a for a multi-stakeholder approach in shaping this process. Um, as, as it's of, as of one of the case, um, some countries uh, prefer to keep this these kind of conversations only restricted to states. But as we all know, other actors have a very important role to play, in particular on cybercrime, in particular the private sector, and of course the civil society. So the UK can help pushing for a more transparent um, uh, process and keep pushing, which it has been doing already for this multi-stakeholder approach. And um, the other aspect of um or like the second point that i want to talk about is just sort of you know the uk's role in policy making is quite important this un process is very important um making sure that the the the, the progress uh, is maintained and built on and transparency that all is important at the same time of course, the UK has a very important role to play in the capacity building um, global forums, the, the, you know, the forums where you have states and uh, uh, non-state actors trying to work together on, um, you know, uh, to, to fight cybercrime. Um, we're quite involved in the global forum on cyber, uh, uh, cyber crime, sorry, global forum on cyber expertise. Um, the uh, the UK has been playing a, a, an important role there. I think this role can be fostered even further. I think there's an important role uh, for the UK to play in, in forums like this, in sharing lessons on how cybercrime can be fought, in investing in cybercrime um, capacity building efforts, and really in adopting a strategic approach to cybercrime and sort of um, you know, sort of sharing lessons from that. It's not just about having a cybercrime law or establishing a cybercrime unit. There's very much, um, there's a need for um, having a strategic approach to cybercrime, which looks at strategic governance aspects, looks at uh, tasking and, you know, uh, prioritization aspects, it looks at enabling framework and so on and so forth. And finally, I want to conclude my remarks by saying that Capacity building on um, cybercrime has to be part of capacity building on cyber more generally. And there have been quite an important, um, I guess, progress um, at the UN level, not just within the sort of, um, you know, what I have been talked to, uh, about in the sort of third committee, but also in the first committee uh, within the open ended working group and the group of governmental experts with very concrete recommendations as to how um, cyber capacity building can be improved and what countries can do in order. The, um, to make some sort of positive steps towards uh, towards increasing that cyber capacity and increasing that resilience and protecting sort of society from all these cyber threats, whether they are um, criminally motivated or politically motivated. And I'll stop here and um, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We'll take the questions um, after all three presentations because I think they'll fit together better uh, like that. Um, uh, that was great to give us the international background, Joyce. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn now to Phil, what the police are doing now to combat cybercrime and what we need to do next. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm stepping in late for Andy Gordon. I do uh, apologise on his behalf. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make today. Uh, but hopefully I will be able to uh, update you as to where we are within UK policing and, and, and cybercrime. Uh, 
we've really been focusing on cybercrime for about the last seven or eight years. Uh, that there was basically since the NCA uh, was created in the NCSC. Uh, and we have what we call Team Cyber UK, which is a whole UK government approach to cybercrime. So from the MCSC to the NCA to policing, uh, we, 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 we have a, a joined up approach in relation to how we deal with cybercrime. Uh, and, and that goes from uh, a national level, so the NCCU, the National Cybercrime Unit. We then have teams at a regional level, uh, looking at regional crimes, cross-border crimes, uh, and those types of things. Then we have fourth level cybercrime units. They're the latest teams that we set up. Uh, we set them up about three years ago, uh, and, and they're focused on victims of cybercrime in forces and giving them, uh, investigating the crimes that are reported, but also that protect and prevent advice. So when somebody becomes a victim of cybercrime, everybody that reports cybercrime into action fraud will get a call from police, and they will get prevention advice because it's not just about them being a victim one time. If they're a victim the first time, we need to stop them being victims again. So that's a really, really important part of what we're doing in relation to uh, cybercrime. And we are making an impact. Uh, the overall reporting of cybercrime is low. And I would, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue for ourselves in policing because we don't have a good understanding of the threat picture in relation to what's going on because businesses don't always report when they've been ransomware, when they've suffered a DDoS attack. A lot of time when you talk to a business and they've been attacked, their main focus is getting themselves back up and running. It's not reporting it to the police. They want to get back up and running. They get their incident response teams in and they don't always report. There's many reasons why they don't report. One is because they want to get themselves up and running, but it's also they don't realize actually what we can do. And there is a lot we can do. Uh, you're right. Cybercrime is an international problem. You know, it's borderless. But there are lots of UK offenders out there as well. And we're making some real strides into identifying them and tackling them. Uh, in relation to the police response, so like I say, we have regional response with the regional crime teams, uh, and they're based all over the country, and they're an amalgamation of, of forces. We have 10 in the UK, uh, and they're looking at the, the more serious end uh, alongside the NCA, and then and, and the, the, the larger cyber crimes. And then we have the force teams, every force, like I say, all 43 forces have got one, uh, and they're looking at that more local level. And we break it down into the four P's, as we call it in policing, uh, and that, 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 that's, that's pursue, prevent, protect, and prepare is the way that we formate, formulate our, our police response. Pursue, it's quite obvious, it's, it's, uh, it's the investigations, it's a cybercrime investigating that. We also put a lot of effort into prevent, uh, and that is around uh, engaging with people that are on the cusp of cybercrime uh, and, and pushing them away from cybercrime into cybersecurity. And, and showing them that actually, one, they're committing criminal offences, because a lot of times people don't always realise what they're doing may be a criminal offence or not. Uh, so we do a lot of, of, of energy in that. Uh, we have a prepare, so that's looking at future planning and preparing ourselves and organisations for the threat of cybercrime. It's not standing still, it's moving forward. Uh, and then we have the protect element, which is that cybersecurity. It's that advice into business and organisations and, and members of the public. And that's all sizes from, you know, your individual through to SMEs, through to multinationals, and how they can better protect themselves. And I'll talk about some of the projects we've got running in the background. We're also looking at, and one of my areas is the dark web. So we, we, we have a, a, a joint unit with the NCA called DICE, uh, dark web intelligence collection and exploitation. And what we're looking at there is, is criminality on the dark web. So it's the sale of drugs, anything or that's going on in dark web, sale of drugs, credit card numbers, uh, guns and all of that. That's what we're looking at. And, and again, we, we're showing some really good results into that repatriation of card numbers and that type of stuff. Really trying to get uh, utilizing technology to help policing do what we need to do to protect the, you know, the UK as a whole. Uh, as I said, there's, there's a number of initiatives that, that, that I just want to touch on. Uh, there's lots of things going on within policing, uh, all the way from we have cyber dogs. We have dogs that are specially trained to detect electronic devices. So we can go in and we can uh, identify USB sticks and stuff like that. They're brilliant. Everybody loves cyber dogs. Uh, so we, we've, rolled, we've been rolling that out. We, we have specialist vans that we use to be able to go to scenes, to be able to do on-scene examinations when we need to. And there's lots of little projects like that being run by the MPCC Cybercrime Programme, which is what I'm part of. Uh, some of our bigger initiatives, and, and the two that I'd like to talk to today, is one's the Cyber Resilience Centres. Uh, every single area of the UK has got a Cyber Resilience Centre. Uh, and these are organisations that are set up, they're like a, a partnership between policing, industry and academia to help protect businesses. So you can sign up. There's lots of advice that's given out by them. It's all based on the NCSC advice. And if you've not been to the NCSC website and you, you do run an SME or you run any size company, 
go to their website and have a look at the advice that's on there. It's really, really good. You know, they really know what they're doing. These are the top people. They're linked to GCHQ. You know, they are people that are able to advise on how to how to secure your networks. So we use that advice, but we we also work with the universities and use use interns and students to help give out that cybersecurity advice. There's a lot of businesses that have very little cybersecurity uh, infrastructure, and and it's not part of the, the way that that they're they're thinking. They're focusing on their business, and they may have grown from a very small company and just grown up. Uh, and it may not never have entered their radar. So we're able to go in and work with those companies. You know, I've been involved in, in, in investigating cybercrime for seven years. And a lot of the cybercrimes we investigate, it's the simple things that hadn't been done that could have prevented it from happening. So, you know, it's, it's giving out that simple advice and, and doing the, the basics right will protect you from the majority of cybercrime that's going on. Uh, so the, the, the resilience centers, you can join up. They're free to join up. There, there are other membership options there as well. They're not they're, they're, they're linked to policing, but you're not joining the police. It's this amalgamation, and it's that advice that you get in uh, from the police advice, working with academia and business to better protect our communities as, as, as best we can. Uh, the other one is, is a project that I'm, I'm leading on. It's called the Police Cyber Alarm. Uh, if you want to know more information about it or sign up, hopefully, uh, if you go to cyberalarm.police.uk, that's the website. Cyberalarm is all about, uh, there's two faces to it. One is for police to be able to get better intelligence. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times attacks, uh, anybody that works in the in, in the cybersecurity industry that's on the, on, on the online, you'll know if you look at a firewall log and you see what attacks are going in your firewall, it's constant. These attacks are constantly going. It's like somebody rattling your front door. You know, if it was a burglary and somebody was, you know, or a burglar rattling front doors going down the street, somebody would probably ring the police and expect us to do about it. Because it's online, we've built this whole industry and we have this 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 attitude that actually it's just, we, we just have to put up with it and we don't. But what we need as police, we need to have that intelligence. We need to understand what's going on so we can plan, we can identify criminals that are committing attacks and we can actually, you know, build that strategic picture but also deal with the criminality. So that's why we, what Cyberalarm does, uh, it, you put a small piece of software on your network and it monitors your firewall logs. It's not monitoring your firewall traffic. We're not actually able to recreate. It's not looking at the packets. It's monitoring the logs that come out on the back of that, which is if you ever suffer a cyber attack and you get the police involved, it's one of the first things we'll ask to look at. Can we look at your logs? Because it's exactly the same as going into any crime scene, looking for something physical, your log, the logs tell me as an investigator what's happened and how it's happened. So what we're getting is we're getting those logs before it's reported as a crime. We're getting it as an intelligence item, which allows us to do something about it. We're able to do something with that. But what we feed back to the organizations, then, and it's a completely free tool, what we feed back to the organizations is they get reports going back into them at the moment once a month, which explains to them what attacks they've had going on on the networks, who's been attacking them. So if you're a small company, uh, and you only work within your region. You know, your, your, your user base, your, your, your sales base is just within your, your area. But majority of your attacks are coming from abroad. Then you can consider, well, do I need to shut down some of those IP addresses that are attacking me? I understand better what's going on. So, and also the ports that are being attacked. So, you know, one of the main or one of the, the ways that people attack your network is through RDP. You know, and if, you've got, if you're using RDP, you need to have it turned on. But if you're not using RDP as part of your business, turn that port off. You're locking that door. You're stopping somebody from being able to attack you. So Police Cyber Alarm gives you that intelligence. It gives you that information as a business to be able to look at that and go, right, okay, how do we better secure ourselves? We also give you local information around what the attacks going on in your area. So it localizes cybercrime and also your industry sector. What we're also able to do, we're also able to do vulnerability scans on your uh, IP ranges and your websites. And again, you get that back in the report that tells you what vulnerabilities you've got. We use the CVE scores that anybody in IT, you know, cybersecurity will understand. You're able to then go onto the CVE website and you're able to see how to fix those uh, those uh, vulnerabilities. Now, of course, if you're a business that hasn't got a, uh, hasn't got, a, you know, you, you're not okay with cybersecurity, then that's where the resilience centers can come in because they can look at those reports and they can help advise you on how to fix those problems, or you can go to anybody within cybersecurity and say, I've got this vulnerability report here. I don't understand how to fix this. How do I go about and do it? And it is that that education piece and that understanding, because if you understand your threat picture better as a business, we understand the threat picture better. It will be a lot easier. It, it will make our lives a lot easier to understand what is going on and how we can best tackle the threat that is that is going on there. So 
yeah, I, I think I probably overran a little bit there. So, so I do apologize, Victoria. Uh, so yeah, happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. And I, I love the idea of the dogs, you know, <laughs> Hudson and Rex in the UK. So anyway, thank you very much, Phil. That no was problem. great. Um, I'd like to turn to you now, Victoria, to tell us about the work that you've been doing support in, in supporting individuals and SMEs to keep safe online. Thank you, Louise. So one of the features of this debate that I find increasingly fascinating is how cybercrime means very different things to different stakeholders. Um, if you're engaged in multilateral negotiations of, of the type that Joyce um, explains, uh, if you're Russia in particular, if you're China, um, you consider cybercrime to be a national security threat, possibly even a military If you are supporting um, individuals who are reporting crimes or SMEs, um, then this is very much about civilian support uh, and business support. Um, and, and if we think about that proposed cyber convention, it's on countering the use of ICTs for criminal purposes. It's not necessarily about um, the cyber operations or the Tallinn manual space that so much time and effort has been spent on. Now, when I worked in law enforcement, and this is going back 10 or 15 years, we took a lot of time and effort to just motivated cybercrime. Um, and we were able to do that rather cleanly. But if we think now even about something like ransomware that ostensibly has a financial motivation, um, that's become a national security issue. It's become a nation state issue, not least because it's quite often state sponsored or states quite often in, in some cases benefit from uh, the profits of ransomware. Um, of course, state sponsored activity is also difficult to attribute um, and it's become a national security issue and as much as critical This is now being targeted by something which originally was financially motivated. Now, these blurred distinctions matter because it can sometimes lead and, and in, I would argue all too often leads to confusion on how we communicate cybercrime prevention to these different stakeholder groups. And I would argue we all need to think more about communicating differently on cybercrime to different stakeholder groups because that militarization of cyberspace and the issue of cybercrime means that you know all too often individuals with something that they have to feel they cannot control they cannot learn enough about and they can do nothing about and um, so my research in the last few years has been looking specifically at communications on cybercrime and cybersecurity. And I looked at government and law enforcement communications and full disclosure, as someone who used to write the EU's threat assessment on cybercrime, you know, I am one of those people who has generated this fear, uncertainty and doubt in the past. Um, I looked at government law enforcement communications, cybersecurity vendor communications, and I think what Phil said and how that perhaps doesn't make people feel very capable or very engaged in, in uh, cybercrime reporting and prevention is, is really pertinent here. And I also looked at criminal communications, so ransomware pop-up screens, um, phishing emails, sextortion emails. And uh, strikingly and surprisingly, I found really quite considerable similarity between how governments um, criminals and vendors all communicated to us as citizens and small businesses about cybercrime and cybersecurity. So firstly, mystifying the... I love Phil's idea of cyber dogs. I'm trying to work out how I can get hold of one because a cyber dog sounds like they don't need quite as much care and attention as someone you know as irresponsible as me can muster. Um, but we have these portmanteau, you know, cyber bullying. What does that actually mean? What does cyber sex mean? It's, you know, these are things that are remote from us that sound like something to do with machinery, 
that are inhumane or inhuman and that we most often associate with robots, um, with faceless grim reaper hackers in hoodies. Um, we talk about darkness all the time. Side of the internet. So it's, it's literally in shade and metaphorically in shade. And of course, that ties to the scaremongering that we all do around this, but particularly, dare I say, some cybersecurity vendors do, ramping up the fear, at times inflating the threat. And that's not to say that there aren't really serious threats attached to cybercrime and national security issues that nation states and people need to. Um, take account of and respond accordingly. But by ramping up the fear and using jargon and mis- You know, there's one cybersecurity vendor last year during the pandemic um, said that we need to secure our everything right now because a global cyber pandemic is now a reality. You know, that's not only ethically and morally questionable to play on people's fears and alert fatigue, but actually what does that do to improve people's level of protection and knowledge, except to get them to buy a thing that they don't understand? But at the same time, threats like disinformation and influence operations put responding to national security threats. You know, if, if we are on Facebook and other social media platforms um, seeing misinformation about COVID vaccines, or we're in the middle of an election and we see information about Black Lives Matter that is intended to sow discord in our communities, it's up to us and our friends and our families to be that first line of defense, to use our critical judgment. So it seems that now is, is more important than ever before to make sure that in accessible fashion and empowered to take control of their online interactions. Um, now we've seen some great examples of that in the UK, certainly last year, um, if we think about the scam and the, the, the phishing reporting function that the NCSC operated for COVID scams, uh, the fact that there was so much appetite for that and that people responded in their many thousands and reported these scams suggests to me that there is a real appetite for citizens and small businesses to get more involved. This and you know, actually being the, the active marshals of this space rather than just passive recipients and victims of the threat. Um, and I mentioned quite a negative example of, of using the pandemic there. Um, but I also think the pandemic has shown us something really, really promising. Um, and that is that, you know, perhaps despite some of our pessimistic expectations, and I am a natural pessimist when it comes to things like cyber threats. And um, many millions of us around the world have shown ourselves capable of wearing masks, engaging in social to protect ourselves and others. So, you know, it is possible um, to deploy public health measures on things like a pandemic. So, um, Actually, I'm not the first person to suggest that we apply public health frameworks to cybersecurity. Um, you know, going back at least 10 or 15 years, a number of researchers have suggested that we could apply a public health framework to cybercrime and cybersecurity uh, in the same way that we do to, to things like epidemics. Um, so, for example, looking at um, measures favored towards non-communicable cyber threats and then equally to cyber risk behaviors. Um, so I would like to see more accessible information sharing and more accessible engagement with citizens and with SMEs, the like of which, you know, Phil has, has absolutely described very well. And, and I would argue also the UK is a, a, a bit of a global leader in, um, but thinking about, you know, what does the cyber version 
of that old mantra of coughs and sneezes spread diseases look like? Um, because now is a people out there have um, to protect themselves and others. I think it's eminently applicable to cyber. So that's a, a, a plea, if you will, from me. Um, for those folks that still engage in the whole fear, uncertainty and doubt rhetoric, that that may work. And, and maybe the way that we want to, um, you know, a, a attenuate large corporations, and it may be appropriate when we're looking at national security threats and military operations, but it's entirely inappropriate for citizens and small businesses. And we really need to think about what might work I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Victoria. I've got quite a lot of questions here. My, my first one will be, um, what are the top things that each of you think businesses and individuals can do to protect themselves on, online? Phil, could I start with you on that one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, top three. I suppose it's it's the, for me, and, and like I say, I've been investigating cybercrime and involved in, in, in in this area for, for a number of years, it, it's doing the basics. So it's, you know, we're still not having everybody use strong passwords, you know, and that is still one of the main ways of people being able to compromise your system. So, you know, strong passwords, unique passwords, using a password manager. If you are going to use, you know, and, and the, the age old question is, well, what is a strong password? Well, the NCSC guide is just three random words. It's not perfect, but it is a really good way of creating a strong password. You know, computers are really good at, at, at figuring out short passwords that have got special characters in and stuff like that. Actually, the longer the password, the better. The more unique the password is better. So if you can use a password manager, brilliant. If not, three random words. And unique passwords for as many of your systems as possible. In the perfect world, every one of your systems and, and logins would be a unique password. I'm aware that that's really hard to do. But, you know, your email accounts, they're the, they're the root to all of your majority of your systems. So strong passwords. Using 2FA as well alongside it. So if there's options to use 2FA, do that. Uh, patch. As a business, patch, patch, patch. You know, have a patching schedule in place. Make sure you're patching regularly. The amount of times we go into organizations, they've suffered an attack. And when you pick it apart, they could have patched away that they could have patched the vulnerability away, but they didn't do. And and that is that is a, a, a real issue. And then education of your staff, you know, educating them so they understand what they shouldn't be clicking on. And just that, you know, cybersecurity is everybody's problem. It's for us all to do, just like physical security is for everybody to do. You know, you'd expect somebody in your business to challenge somebody who wasn't wearing an ID badge or something like that. It's exactly the same with your digital security, you know. So, so yeah, there's lots of things, but they're, they're the main ones that I would, I would point out. It's absolutely great. Um, Joyce, would you like to go next? Sure. I mean, um, as as Phil mentioned, all of all of these are great advice, and the NCSC they put regularly, really sort of very digestible and accessible advice to the public and, and SMEs. I'll probably add a couple of things. I think as as citizens, as users of the internet, I think being vigilant is very important. Um, you know, phishing attacks remain uh, one of the key ways for criminals to get into people's uh, you know computer data and systems. So um, just you know, being vigilant and um, and uh, try and sort of be aware of those sort of social engineering attacks. I think that's quite important. And for businesses, I think one of the um, biggest things we have seen in our work is the importance of having cyber incident response plans in place. Um, uh, you know, plans that are uh, re rehearsed and practiced and reviewed on a regular basis. So whenever you are a victim of a cyber incident, the organization has a very clear way to dealing with that uh with that problem and everyone is aware of like you know what they should be doing and what are the lines that should be communicating so i think having this this sort of um a clarity in response help with building resilience and help build or help sort of uh survive uh, potential attacks thanks very much um uh, I feel like I've been left with the very boring options. Um, so, but uh, but I think they're important. And and the boring option is, um, particularly if you're a business, 
just audit. Boring. Control. Um, we see so many legacy insider threats because someone has been granted access to a particular network or a particular system. And when they leave an organization, they still have that access and, and they're rogue. Um, you know, so there are those opportunities need to be closed down. Um, but also, as Phil mentioned about legacy software and tooling. Um, he mentioned in, in relation to RDP, but we see this all the time. You know, people buy the nice shiny thing um, with limited capability to um, retire what they've already. Thanks very much. I've, I've got a great stew really of, 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 of questions here. Um, do you think that regulation of the dark web and solving anonymity issues would help combat cybercrime. I don't know who wants to. Uh, as an independent researcher, I'm, I'm quite happy to <laughs> go in there, Phil, and, and, and take the heat on this one. I think it's absolute nonsense, personally. Um, and it, it is something that I'm going to be writing, at, <laughs> writing about at length. Um, but de anonymizing. that allows for identification of someone who has already done something bad. Um, and I think regulating the dark web, that's a little bit like trying to regulate the Wild West, isn't it? Which is a metaphor that we keep hearing uh, about the internet. But um, I think, you know, the, the regulation that's being proposed with the online safety bill, and I don't want to um, steal somebody else's uh, thunder on another panel, um, is not about the dark web. The dark web is much more about the kind of thing that Phil's team does and is about infiltration, not about de-anonymization. Yeah, would you like, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it will be an ongoing debate. And, and one of the, the conversations that we have on a regular basis is, well, what is the dark web? The dark web is an encrypted platform. So if you, if you follow that line through, should we, de-encrypt WhatsApp? Should we de-encrypt all of these, you know, HTTPS? We need encryption for security. Unfortunately, it comes with risks and it's getting that balance right. Do we have the balance right at the moment? I'm not sure. It, it, it's not, you know, I can't really comment on that. But, you know, there, there is that, with, you know, you, how would you be able to regulate it? I just don't understand. You know, it would be it would be really, really difficult to do. I think it's conversations that we should have definitely around what, you know, what policing should be able to access and, and that type of stuff and what should be should be retained if something goes wrong. But the internet is an international, you know, everybody uses it. So you can't just look at it around UK law or, you know, our country's law. You've got to look at it across everybody. So I think it'd be really, really difficult, really, really difficult thing to do. And I would also that 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 question is well, what do we actually mean by the dark web? A lot of times we're talking about Tor. But actually, what you're talking about is encrypted platforms and peer-to-peer so -peer, end end-to-end encryption. Joyce, do you want to add anything to that? Really, I'm, I mean, completely agree with uh, with Phil and Victoria. I think this is uh, ought to be part of a larger conversation around how to get the balance right between sort of protecting national security, fighting crime, and safeguarding rights. And uh, you know, and I think there's absolutely a necessity here for uh, engaging in a, in a proper debate around this issue. Um, and and you know, the anonymization is a, an absolute must on the internet, not just for human rights, but also sort of for privacy reasons. And and of course, um, you know, kind of financial. Uh, uh, purposes and Tor was uh, already, you know, started for reasons of, um, you know, started with the, with the military, wasn't it? As a uh, with the U.S. military, as to kind of to, to protect uh, uh, the sort of that sort of confidentiality element, and it, we need that sort of confidentiality element for whistleblowers, etc. So I would argue, yes, agree that this has to be part of a larger debate about how to get the balance right. Okay, we're we're nearly out of um, out of time, sadly. Uh, um, I think one of the things that shocked me about the Ofcom Online Nation report was that they said that only five percent of people that they surveyed um, felt they were competent in accessing the internet. Now, a number of the questions that we've had have been about education and so on. Can you give us? one thing each of you before we have to end um, uh, uh, about what you think 
the most effective way of educating small businesses and uh, individuals in this country um, to reduce their likely, likelihood of becoming a victim to cybercrime would be. Victoria, would you like to go first? Yes, and I'll be very brief. I think one of the greatest um, or most persuasive examples that we have at the moment use humour. You know, there are some great adverts out there at the moment that treat, um, you know, dealing with cybercrime and cyber. We should, we should be doing more of that and less of the scaremongering. Okay, Joyce. Maybe sort of, I uh, think a lot of people think that they are, they know that cybercrime exists, but they think that they are sort of shielded from that or that, that it won't be a victim. So I guess maybe trying to communicate the impact and the, the threats that exist out there to people who are not very much familiar with that, I think would be quite important and will go a long way in educating the public about how to be more vigilant and more and adopt the cyber hygiene approach. Okay, Phil. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd agree with uh, what Joyce and Victoria have said. I, I, I think, uh, you know, simplifying it. I mean, a lot of times people are scared because it's, you know, oh, it's technical. I, I don't do technical. Uh, and that type of response is common. So it's, it's simplifying it down and making it as easy for people to understand what they're doing. So it's an education piece. And I think all the way from school, primary school up, you know, cybersecurity should be threaded in. Just like we get taught now, you know, or we used to get taught the Green Cross Code and stuff like that. That, you know this this online security should be taught from a, from a very very young age people are often talking about um, the need to get do things in school but um, parents need to know an awful lot don't they and and also um, uh, can employers do more to help to educate people not just what they do in their business but what they do at home Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Louis. I, you know, Louise, it's uh, like you say, it's that education across the board because a lot of people, you know, uh, I don't like the term digital native, and and but you know that that idea that that we've not grown up with technology, so you know, but like you say, if if you can educate it within, because everything you get taught about your business security will be reflective in, in your home life as well around phishing, that you know, scams, how to protect your networks and stuff like that. So yeah, I. I... I fear we're out of time now. Uh, it's been absolutely great to have uh, all of you here. I think we could have talked for another 45 minutes um, without any problems at all. Thank you all so much.